thank you um, for the introduction. And um, yeah, as, as Jason mentioned that uh, in my current role, uh, apart from the research activities, another, another key uh, responsibility that uh, we, we are trying to handle is finding a strategic direction with, with the new age of computing, essentially. So, uh, but today I will actually, I don't go over the details of the problem that we are doing at Ford, but we'd rather be talking about in general, what we mean by quantum computing and how exactly it is different, how it works, and give you some example problems uh, so that we have an idea about uh, what is the right use case to look for, and how we are expecting a computational speed up. So um, I will go over these initial slides very quickly. So this is how a computer used to look like in 100 BC. And you all know that we actually come through a long path and this is how it looks like in 2020, the super clusters. And the history, um, so the history here is actually very much aligned with the history of the digital innovation um, that we have seen for almost the last 60 years or so. Um, kind of in order to put that in, in, the, con in the right context, uh, the history of computing so far has been concentrated on what we colloquially refer to as the classical computing. Um, so I'll just, uh, so uh, Jason, just one thing before I go forward. So I get all these requests to admit people. Should I admit them or I just uh don't? Uh, I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sure. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Great. So, um, in order to put it in the right context, so when we distinguish between classical computing versus quantum computing, essentially, uh, we are not really talking about a powerful computer, but we are actually thinking about some very fundamental natural laws that will enable us to perform a very different type of computing, um, where the advantage is. Uh, guaranteed for certain class of problems and uh, the advantage always uh, will demonstrate some outperformance with respect to whatever the way uh, we can design our classical computer. Right? So a very quick, um, you know, the bookkeeping. So when we discuss the classical computing, essentially we say that there are some um, classical building blocks. It could be a transistor and then as you know, that they can be in a two different states, for example, on and off, we can call them zero or one. And apart from that, there are some classical Boolean logic gates, for example, AND gate or NOR, XOR, or whatever. And you, if you know how to perform these classical gate operations on the classical hardware, um, where a bunch of classical gates are connected to each other, then essentially, if you know to perform certain gates, for example, uh, XOR gate, uh, then it is guaranteed that we actually have a universal classical computer. We can perform any Boolean logic. You can, you can implement any Boolean logic in that device. Um, now, this is actually a very crucial thing because um, like 60, 70 years ago, when our ancestors were thinking about computing, their mindset was, okay, we do have computational challenges around us. So the question is, how can we come up with a single machine uh, that can solve all the computational problems, right? And that has been quite successful. But on the other side, as, as an outcome of it, what happened is whatever the problems that are easy to solve, we actually have solved them. And the remaining problems are hard. And uh, not only that, remaining problems are proven to be hard. Uh, for these computing models. So the question is, can we go beyond this computing model? Even if the scope is limited, can we make sure if we can perform some computation for some of the hard problems um, that are hard for the classical computers and gain some computational advantage? Now, that's exactly where these advanced computing platforms slowly started to emerge. People actually tried all sorts of different things uh, but then when, after the discovery of quantum mechanics, I think it was quite eminent that probably these are exactly the laws that we needed uh, in order to demonstrate a real advantage with respect to a classical phenomenon. 
So before going to the quantum domain, just a last comment. So for example, um, the, when I say hard problems, I will probably try to define them at least semi-formally. Uh, but uh, so uh, for example, the vehicle routing problem uh, or the knapsack problem or the factoring problem, um, uh, you know, the subset sum problem, if you, if you can come across them in the computer science literature. So these are some examples of the hard problems that, that we are thinking about. So these are hard in the sense that if you try to solve them using your classical computer, and if you increase your input size, um, then the resource, either in terms of uh, the time or in terms of uh, the partial resource, they actually grow uh, quite drastically, which is huge. Okay, so now, um, in the last century or so, we have at least attempted to understand the quantum world. Um, and what we realized is quantum world is actually not governed by probabilities, um, very much uh, different from the classical world. And it, it, as opposed to the probabilities, actually quantum world is governed by something called amplitudes. Now these amplitudes are also numbers, just like probabilities, but their the domain is different. Right? So uh, these quantum amplitudes that we're talking about, if these can be, in general, these can be complex numbers. Uh, this can be negative, of course, but this can be complex. So that's, uh, that's actually a very different criteria. In the classical world, we do not see any mechanism, any evolution of the classical system um, for which we are, we are enforced uh, to talk about such complex numbers. Um, but in the quantum world, it's actually mandatory. Right? Now then the question is, if I have a quantum system, um, of course, just like classical system, I can try to build up a quantum system that has multiple states in it, and I can use two of those states and call them zero or one. Then the question is, can we perform some beat operations uh, on those quantum bits or qubits, um, which actually carry complex numbers. So the answer to that question is yes, if you have enough quantum control. Now, the, the implication of this simple fact is very crucial. So essentially the fact is that if you have a quantum bit or a qubit, uh, you can, with the help of those uh, quantum gate operations, you can actually prepare them in, in, in an arbitrary superposition of states. And this is, this is actually the main uh, power behind quantum mechanics, because essentially quantum mechanics says that the reason why it requires uh, complex numbers to describe the universe, because in the quantum world, uh, a system can be in multiple different states at the same time. And if you measure them, the probabilities that you obtain, this entire process actually involves these complex numbers. So essentially the quantum gates as opposed to the classical gate. Uh, for example, this is the truth table for a classical gate. If you, if, if you have to write a truth table for the quantum gate, uh, then the matrix that transform your input to the output, it will actually involve, uh, involve uh, uh, complex numbers. Now, um, there are two properties. Uh, I already talked about the superposition where uh, unlike the classical states like head or tail or zero or one, uh, in fact, that you actually can prepare a quantum state, uh, not only uh, on two different locations, for example, the North Pole and the South Pole of a sphere, but anywhere on this entire sphere. So that kind of gives you uh, some additional computational resource uh, to begin with. Right, because it's it's a north pole versus south pole, but but the, uh, versus the entire surface that is offered by the sphere. Right, so this is a, this is a good start. Of course, that's a big question. If this is alone, is this sufficient or not to to get the advantage that we are looking for? Um, yeah, I'll come back to that question later. Uh, but let's look at another quantum property, which is called tunneling. Uh, essentially, the idea is if you have, if you are living in a classical world, then if you, for example, if you have the round object and if you have a barrier, if the kinetic energy of this ball is less than the potential energy required to cross the barrier, in the classical world, the ball will never cross the barrier. Uh, unlike the quantum world, which essentially tells us that 
if we have a quantum ball, so let's think about an electron or a tiny particle, and if we have a potential barrier on which you have trapped it, then even if the kinetic energy of the of the ball is smaller than the potential barrier, there is a probability that it can actually tunnel through the door. Um, this is this looks like fiction, but on the other hand, this is a very real mechanism. This is exactly how radioactivity happens, right? So you see those um, beta particles, and those beta particles, they are electrons, but they are not coming out of the orbitals, but they are coming out of the nucleus, right? It, it, it is actually tunneling through the huge nuclear binding energy, and you can detect them outside. So that is exactly what is going on there. Uh, now, the reason why uh, I'm talking the tunneling is you can actually take that idea and use it maybe to solve some computational problems. So, for example, if you're solving some optimization problem, it, it happens everywhere. In the, in the global optimization problem, uh, the emergence of local minima are actually decreased. Right? And most of the traditional algorithms that you can think of um, they actually uh, kind of uh, stick to you in some local minimum. And if you want to hop out, it that takes quite a bit of time and quite many iterations of the need. On the other hand, if I know somehow how to uh, mimic quantum tunneling, um, probably there is a way to solve such optimization problem faster. And that is exactly what people are adapting nowadays in something called quantum Monte Carlo approaches and quantum stack. So these are actually two different um, world that we are talking about. And from this slide onward, I'll probably, um, as you know, I'll probably concentrate more on the, on the quantum computer side. So here is a one slide primer, how it works. So the first thing that you need, as I mentioned, a qubit. A qubit is nothing but a two level quantum system where you know how to prepare uh, in any of these two states. For example, let's say the zero state, uh, then that can give you a qubit, but apart from the state preparation, you also have to make sure that you know how to read it out. So for example, if somehow your qubit in some superposition of being a zero or being a one, then when you are measuring it, uh, you have to make sure that you are, you are uh, extracting the right statistics uh, when you are performing the right thing. And the readout time is actually uh, sufficient in order to get rid of the noise or whatever. The next thing that we need is to, is to, um, is the capability to perform uh, any single qubit operations. Now, when I say that the qubit is a two-level system, um, without going to the map, I can just tell you that these two-level system can exactly be thought of the surface of a sphere, often called a block sphere. And therefore, any, any single qubit operation is actually some rotation on the block sphere, right? Um, and as you know that uh, there are Euler angles, you don't have to know how to rotate it about X and Y and Z independently, but it will suffice if you know how to rotate in any, of, any two of those three uh, rotation axes. And uh, so these are actually denoted by the quantum X, Y, and Z gates. Um, for computational purposes, there is a specific quantum gate that gets used quite often. Um, uh, so, so often that one can consider that as an independent basis. So this is called the Hadamard gate, but essentially all these uh, rotations are actually some rotations that are used uh, at the last year. Um, so you need a qubit, you need to be able to rotate it uh, uh, on the block sphere the way you want. The third criteria then tells you that um, if you know how to connect two qubits, how to couple two qubits, then you have to be able to do uh, a two qubit operation. So not just any two qubit operation, but some, some special ones. And these are called the two qubit entangling operations. So here is an example of a two qubit entangling operation called a control not qubit. What it does is if your first qubit is zero, it doesn't do anything on the second qubit. The first qubit, the X, is called a control qubit, and the second is called the target qubit. Um, and if the first qubit is one, if your control is one, it actually performs a not operation on your second qubit. So that's why it's called it's called a control node. Now, now 
So if you are coming from the classical computing perspective, then one can say that, okay, I can implement it in the classical world as well. But when I'm writing this transformation matrix uh, or the or the matrix correspond to the C0 gate, also note that when I'm thinking about applying these operations, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to be able to know how to perform this operation on these basis states, for example, 00011011. But you, you should be able to perform this operation even if your input state is some superposition of all this one, right? And from that perspective, it is actually different because quantum gates, if we apply them on the basis space, there is no difference between classical and quantum computing. But if we apply them on, on a state that is already in superposition, um, that's where the difference comes in. And that, that is probably one source of the computational advantage. Okay. Okay, now, if you guarantee these three criteria, then this, there essentially there is something called a universality theorem. And universality theorem tells you that if you know how to perform single qubit operations, and if you know how to perform C0 gate, for example, then any multi qubit quantum operations can be decomposed uh, in, these two, uh, in these two operations, either single qubit or two qubit. Control. So that was a phenomenal progress at that time. And that was the first time people realized, okay, now there's a chance that we can actually think of building a quantum computer because there is a universal, just like there is an universality theorem for the classical world uh, for, or the classical computing, for example, like SOR gate, probably. Um, this is exactly the same universality that can be carried forward uh, into the quantum world. So end of the day, what, um, what we can do, so if we are trying to solve a problem, End of the day, we have to find a good quantum circuit for the problem. Uh, we pre-process that circuit so that the circuit can be written in terms of single qubit operations and then the two qubit operations. And then we will um, use a quantum hardware if, if whenever, I mean, you can use a quantum hardware now, but the, the limitation is the number of qubits. But we end up that we will use a scalable quantum computer in our input. That are circuit, depending on how the circuit, how big the circuit is, and how many qubits are available to implement that circuit. So that is the um, big picture how one can think about quantum. Computer. Okay, so let's um, change uh, our gear a little bit because I think many uh, people in the audience are also from the analytics. Computational perspective. So, if I just take the computer science view, um, the theory of computing is actually pretty new. Even though the theory of computers are kind of new, right? people have been uh, experimenting with abacus, uh, all other clock makers. They have a very long history uh, how to make use of the computers. Um, now. On the other hand, uh, when we are thinking about uh, a cogent and coherent theory that, that can tell us some useful information about what is computable and what is not, that I think started uh, in the beginning of last century uh, with something called Turing machine. I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's, it's, um, so Turing essentially came up with a mathematical model of computing and came up with, with a thesis, which is called a chart Turing thesis, which essentially said that if you follow the Turing's model of computing, then any physical system whatsoever that we observe in nature can be efficiently simulatable on that Turing machine. Now that's a strong statement. And uh, well, I mean, if you say that any physical system is simulatable on a Turing machine, it's not that strong of a statement because Turing machine has an inherent capability to deal with um, you know, the, the tapes and the symbols and how to perform the Boolean logics and things like that. But if you add the word efficiently, that's a strong statement. Um, and that is that is something called charge, charge during physics. Um, in, from the computer science perspective, it is still an unsolved problem because I don't think anybody has, and if you can solve it, that's a millennium, uh, millennial prize or something, right? Because that's the problem of the field constraint and things like that. But it is strongly believed today that the strong or extended charge during this is probably wrong because we do know a lot of hard computations and there is no algorithm that is known that we can use in the classical computer, even though there is no proof. Now let's make, uh, let's make it a little bit more formal. So when I say efficient, what, what do I exactly mean? 
So it means that a computation, I can call it efficient if it requires polynomial resource. When I say resource, it could mean that polynomial number of, by polynomial resource, I might mean the polynomial number of bits of the memory, um, or uh, if it is a temporal resource, then polynomial resource means it requires polynomial amount of time to solve the problem. Um, now, also in the computer science, they don't talk about individual computational challenges that we come across, but they talk about the family of problems um, and they define that as a class. The relationship between a problem and the class where the problem belongs to actually comes through uh, the concept of reduction. So for example, if we have a computational problem A, and if I say that I have a proof that A can be reduced to another problem B, essentially what I mean that there is an algorithm, if there is an algorithm that can solve B efficiently, then I can call that algorithm as a subroutine in order to solve A efficiently. Essentially, if you don't wanna go deep, it just means that if problem A is reducible to problem B, it just means very clearly. So if you look at this Venn diagram sort of picture, this is very much favorite in the computer science domain. Um, um, and and this, is, this is interesting in the, in, the, in the context of quantum as well. So this rectangle, this big green rectangle called the P space class, it means um, the set of problems for which we know there exists an algorithm that can solve it using polynomial spatial resource. So for example, polynomial number of bits, but we do not know anything about the requirement of temporal resource. So it can be exponential in time, we don't know that, but it just requires polynomial number of special resource. That's what I call PCS. So computer scientists did a phenomenal job starting from the beginning of 1970s um, in order to show that the most of the important uh, complexity classes they actually uh, are contained within P space. So one big example um, is this big yellow circle. This is called NP. Um, this NP essentially means the problem, if I give you the answer, then you can verify them in polynomial time, but you cannot find the solution in polynomial time. Of course, I am very naive here. There is a rigorous definition and that talks about um, the, the formal verification of a certificate. But uh, just naively speaking, it just means that uh, you can verify whatever, if a problem is in NP, you can uh, verify the solution uh, in very, very easily by finding the solution. Um, now, um, now, another important class is this red circle called P, and it essentially means the problem for which we know efficient algorithm for verification for sure and also for solution. So most of the problems that we have dealt so far are actually the problems that we have. Uh, it has been strongly believed, uh, and there are rigorous reasons to believe, although there is no rigorous proof, that if I think about uh, a class of problems that can be efficiently solvable in a quantum computer, also called the BQP class. Now that's how the structure of BQP class should look like. So BQP contains P, which essentially means everything that you can solve in a classical computer would in principle be solved in a quantum computer efficiently. But there are some additional problems that exist on the BQP class for which we do not know of any efficient classical algorithm, and therefore it's not in the P class. One example is actually factory that was discovered in the mid-90s, and that is considered to be one of the biggest use cases of quantum because this is actually the fundamental building block of the encryption of the cryptography that we know. Uh, the RSA algorithm is actually based on factoring. Now, if somebody has a quantum computer, um, in principle, they can actually compromise RSA. Right? So that was, a, that was a big result that came from the Peter Schwartz paper. Um, I will just make a very quick note here because oftentimes there's a confusion and, the, and, and life is not very intuitive. Um, there are many problems in life um, that actually sound very similar, but, but they are actually very different when you try to solve them, right? So one big example is the factoring problem versus primality problem. So factoring problem, the semi-regardless version of it essentially says it's a decision problem. It says that does there exist a non-trivial integer factor that is less than some number for an input integer, right? And that is 
for the factoring problem, we don't know any polynomial algorithm. So we actually placed it outside that peak class. On the other hand, if we look at the finality problem, it sounds very similar. It says, does there exist a non-trivial integer factor for an NP integer? I just removed the condition that less than a number k. And notice that this primality problem is, uh, uh, is a well-known example, which is actually given to you, right? There is, there is an algorithm. There are actually more than one algorithm that we know. Uh, initially, it was thought as, a, as an NP problem, uh, but later in the early 2000s, people discovered the APS primality algorithm or whatever. So, so this primality that it actually uh, puts it. Uh, so just making sure uh, that even if the problems are problem sounds similar, oftentimes they mean very different things when you try to achieve good computation. Um, okay, now, uh, so when I'm talking about this picture so far, uh, essentially I'm assuming that I have a quantum computer. So for example, when I'm talking about this BQP class, I'm assuming that let's say there is a quantum computer, it is scalable, which means that um, I can make it arbitrary and bigger uh, with, with whatever technology that I have, and I can solve an arbitrarily big problem. And also, I am assuming that there is no effect of noise because noise plays a very different role for quantum computer. I'm completely, uh, I think, consciously avoiding avoiding that discussion because that's a that's a big topic. Um, now, under all these assumptions, if all these assumptions are true, then um, from the, from the physics perspective or from the experimental side, uh, we will say that uh, such a computer is called a fault-tolerant quantum computer or fault-tolerant quantum computer. Now, the problem is uh, we are still not there yet, right? So if you look at the news or Google or IBM or whoever who are trying to develop quantum computer and solve problems, they are trying to move to that direction. They have a roadmap, but of course, they are far, far away from building a far in front of computing. So the question is often, and definitely true for academic research, but also in the industry is, before we get to that point when there is a far in front of computing, is there a way we can use the noisy qubits uh, or is there a way we can mimic some quantum effects using some specialized classical hardware in order to solve hard problems? We are not necessarily expecting an exponential speed up, by the way, but we are expecting some sort of speed up that so that it has an overlap with the industry or industry needs. Um, the answer to that question is yes, and this is a very much active area of research, both in academia and industry. And because it has a high demand, um, uh, many people are trying it and they are coming up with different sort of ideas, which actually creates the future. So when we are thinking about the quantum computing approaches, uh, broadly speaking, we are actually thinking four, four fundamentally different approaches to quantum computing. And fault tolerant quantum computing comes here. Uh, it does not have any industry overlap yet because we are not there yet. Uh, maybe the situation will be changing in coming uh, decade or something, but uh, it's still uh, a holy grail of the, of the community. On the other hand, there are other approaches. For example, this gate-based noisy intermediate scale quantum computing of the NISC. The idea is that um, you can use the noisy qubits, um, you couple them, and you perform the quantum gate operations, but before noise affects you, you measure the entire device and you make it classical. So this is another uh, fascinating feature of the quantum world if you have a quantum system, but if you measure them with the classical tools, then it will behave like a classical. End up with the result that you get, uh, those are not very complex numbers. Those are gonna be some real numbers uh, that will tell you something about the program. Right? So the question is, can we define some such shallow circuits so that before noise affects you, you just project it and you just measure it, but you collect the data and the statistics and based on that statistics, um, you try to look for uh, the solution of a problem that has been encoded in that circuit. So this, this is overall, this is called the NISC or the noise intermediate scale quantum because um, we can still make some prog progress with noise activity. We don't uh, need to wait uh, for the time when the fault tolerance for the computer. 
Another uh, approach, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is often called the quantum inspired computing. Um, there is nothing quantum here. It just means that uh, I just mentioned about the quantum tunneling effect. So for example, if you have a hard optimization problem, then um, can we formulate the problem in the right version and invoke some quantum Monte Carlo routine and think about some specialized and dedicated hardware where I can implement those quantum Monte Carlo and Borodomin results that problem so that through that quantum Monte Carlo, I'm limiting the quantum tunnel. If I if I'm successful, uh, it would essentially mean that it will enable me uh, to solve hard optimization problems where I can get rid of the local minimums uh, efficiently, and I can go to uh, a better minimum. We nobody can guarantee if it is a global minimum or not, but I can hop around the local minima way more efficiently than the traditional approach. So this has quite extensively been used for solving discrete optimization problem. I'll give you a few examples, um, but also at the same time for continuous optimization problem, um, I think um, it is gaining more popularity uh, in terms of the material science and the There is another one is called the quantum annealing. Um, it, it's quite, it's, it's there quite for quite a while. Um, so for example, there's a company called G-Wave, they actually offered it uh, as, as a service first, I think uh, in early 2000 or something. So the idea of the quantum annealing is you have a qubit, the qubits are noisy, but you are not performing any quantum gate operations on the qubit. Um, you are encoding your problem uh, on the on the control hardware that is uh, that is driving the quantum in hardware, and you change the condition, the parameters of the quantum hardware uh, slowly or adiabatically, so that uh, under under certain conditions, it guarantees that the entire quantum system is always at its lowest eigen lowest energy state, uh, which essentially means that if you know how to convert an easy problem continuously to a hard problem, and if you know the solution for the easy problem, then there is a quantum effect called adiabaticity that will guarantee you that uh, when you change the quantum hardware, it actually will slowly steer you uh, from the solution of the easy problem to the solution of the hard problem. Uh, very, very naively speaking, because uh, in the quantum world, um, this, is, this is actually a uh, little more complicated because it has, as I mentioned, it has it involves the complex number and the, and the phases of this complex number. The problem with, with this strategy is uh, the, the requirement, the hardware requirement uh, for this approach to war is too restrictive, so much that we have to compromise on the quality of the field. And for that reason, uh, the quantum annealing hardware, uh, whoever who tried to make it, um, they actually noticed that it has an extensive amount of noise, way more noise that we can think of in any other quantum hardware that actually exists here. So with, with, in presence of such a big amount of noise, can it really guarantee any quantum advantage? That has remained a big topic. Essentially, uh, in order to compete with quantum annealing, I think this entire quantum inspired computing approach was born. And the goal here was to demonstrate that they can offer whatever the advantage that quantum ability can achieve. Right? So this is more, you can think of a semi-technical and semi-sociological classification of the way we can think about quantum computing. So just for the sake of time, um, from this point onward, I'll switch my gear a little bit and I'll just take pick one example uh, and uh, try to explain you how quantum computer works. So what is exactly going on inside a quantum computer? How exactly are we preparing those qubits and how those qubits work? And when I'm choosing that example, I'll just choose the example uh, that is one of the most popular approaches right now that is being pursued by Google and IBM called the superconducting quantum computing. So um, in order to think about that, let's just think about some funny physics. So if we have an LC circuit, so this is just, if you're from electrical engineering background, this is just an inductor and this is just a capacitor, then uh, we all know that this is called an LC circuit. And in, an, in any LC circuit, what happens is your charge actually oscillates between the two 
state of the capacitor. Right? Now, this is exactly a simple harmonic oscillator or a pendulum. Right? Now, if you try to look at the energy diagram of that LC circuit um, with respect to position or velocity, uh, you will see that this is the quadratic signature of the energy that you get. We know that we like how to calculate the energy for a simple harmonic oscillator. But on the other hand, this is a classical system and therefore um, energies are continuous. Energies can take any real number um, between, between in, the, in the domains, right? Now, what is interesting here is if you take that circuit and if you put that in a dilution refrigerator um, and maintain that in an ultra cold uh, environment, um, that there are quantum effects that, that, we, that we begin to merge, right? And under that quantum effect, what happens is that energy diagram changes for the speed run. This is called quantization. And that is, um, that is kind of uh, a byproduct of whatever the superposition or entanglement number that we discussed, that the energy level, um, if there is a boundary condition, the energy level cannot be continuous, it has to be discrete. Now the question is, as I mentioned earlier, that in order to um, in order to manufacture a qubit, I need to be able to control a multi-level quantum system and call any two levels as my zero and one. So, so the question is, can I just say that the lowest two energy levels are my zero and one? Well, um, it's very lucrative, but the problem is, if you do that, then you also realize that the separation of the energies between the zero and one, which often called a qubit frequency, this is harmonic here. This is a harmonic oscillator. So the, so the separation is actually same. So if you want to uh, you know, drive, because this is our second criteria, that we have to be able to perform the single qubit operation. So if you want to drive transition in that, in that system, then with whatever the laser or whatever the driving a hardware that you are using, depend on what the frequency is, then you cannot guarantee that you can only drive the transition between the zero and one. You can drive transition throughout this entire spectrum because it's a harmonic picture. So it's a, it's a same spacing everywhere. Now, what we need, we actually need to create some anharmonicity in this picture. We want, we want this multi-level picture, but we want different spacing when you go up across the energy, right? The big problem is um, if we try to do that, then we need some magical element, right? For example, we actually used all the uh, magic that exists in the classical world. For example, the inductor and the capacitor. Resist resistor is uh, out of question because we don't want a resistance in the circuit, but these are all that we know in the electrical engineering. What is that magical element that can give me um, such an anharmonic picture? Well, in the classical world, there is no analog. You, you don't find such an electrical engineering um, com circuit component, but in the quantum world, it's a different story. And that story uh, was discovered by uh, Josephson in, in early 70s and uh, with others as well. Uh, for example, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schiffer. Um, so these people realized a fascinating fact. So they realized that two electrons if you place them in free space, they will always repel each other. We know that from basic physics, it's a Coulomb repulsion, right? Now, if you place two electrons on a condensed matter system or inside a crystal, uh, what will happen is there are sound waves that get, get created by the vibration of those crystals. And the electrons interact with those sound waves called phonons. And electrons mediate an interaction through phonons. So Cooper actually calculated that in interaction and showed that two electrons can attract each other if you place them in a, in a lattice, where there exists a lattice vibration through phononic interaction. That was a fascinating thing. And the reason why it is crucial is the fact, which was discovered by Joseph Simon, which said that um, these pairs of electrons, often called the Cooper pairs, which are responsible for carrying supercurrents, um, it can actually carry supercurrent, not only in a superconductor, but also if you create a superconductor and if you, um, uh, kind of uh, interfered them with, with, uh, with, an, with an insulating barrier, then these this Cooper pairs can pass through one superconductor to another superconductor without even thinking. Again, I'm being naive here. The entire picture is in the uh, momentum space, uh, but I'm kind of avoiding the 
the leaders of the field of theoretical physics, but just uh, understand that these are, these are Cooper pairs and you can actually create such a junction called Josephson junction and Cooper pairs can pass through it. So Josephson also calculated that if you use Josephson junction as a circuit element, then that changes the picture and that exactly creates what we wanted. So instead of a quadratic um, uh, uh, potential energy, you have this tilted washboard potential. And therefore there are metastable states. And if you look at any one of these metastable states, there will still be energy level quantizations, just like there was an energy level quantization for an LC uh, circuit, but these energy levels are going to be separated from each other with an unharmonic state state. And that is exactly what we need. So without going too much details, I'll just show you that based on this idea, people have discovered in 2007, uh, the, the, the circuit the, of the qubit, which is called the transform. So this is how the circuit is. That's, um, uh, and this is, exactly, this is actually the circuit that is being used uh, by the quantum community company, for example. Okay, so, um, so that's about the qubit. And since they are electrical circuit, you can couple them to each other. Um, then how exactly, I mean, if you are thinking not as a quantum engineer, but from, you know, from an, an analyst and, or, or a computer scientist, and if you try to solve your problem, how exactly the workflow will look like? So, of course, you have a quantum hardware I mean, that you need in order to solve the problem, but this quantum hardware um, needs a different language to control. So, therefore, most of the quantum hardware, they come with a classical control. These are actually the pulse generators. And in order to control that pulse generator, most of the companies, they have their quantum software on, on top of it. So if you know how what quantum circuit to implement, you can actually encode that in that quantum software and end of the day, you get a result from the quantum hardware. So that's the input output mechanism when you think about the quantum computing of the service. Now, in this picture, I'm just showing that let's say you have a computational task. So you need to find a good quantum algorithm. You convert it to the circuit, put it inside the quantum computing service and get the data or solution. This is actually a longer route, but this is probably the only route because if you have really hard computational problem, then directly going from the problem to the data or solution, it actually has to pass through an intractable barrier, it, especially if your problems are not within the P class that I mentioned, right? So this is how a workflow will look like. And just giving you some, some very simple examples, I can go to the details of it. Uh, some of them we are very interested in at, at Ford Research as well, and we have pursued them in the past. Um, so for example, um, many of you know that the supply chain optimization and any disruption in the supply chain optimization, uh, depending on the data that you have, it's actually a very, very big graphical network. And you have to, when you try to optimize it, oftentimes the traditional algorithms is not, are not sufficient uh, to even process that data. So that could be a very good use case for quantum. Similarly for routing, um, you have the generalization of what we call the traveling salesman problem. Uh, even if your data is not huge, um, the, the potential solution space is huge. This actually grows factorially. Um, and therefore, if you have multiple vehicles um, that uh, for which you are trying to find an optimal route, um, it, it is a problem which is actually, if you are trying to solve in the naive way, it is a problem which is actually growing uh, even worse than exponential. Um, so uh, in order to solve it using quantum, of course, these are the scenarios and you have to convert the scenarios on the mathematical model. And uh, our approach is actually to convert it into an optimization problem. And when I when you do that, you actually create an objective function. Uh, I'm not gonna go to the details of this thing and you can create for every scenario um, if you know how to convert it to an optimization problem, you get that objective function, and then uh, you actually, um, sorry, you actually um, take that obje uh, objective function and choose one of the QC approaches that I mentioned. For example, the QIO or new star QC, you plug it back in, and when you plug it back in, um, through that process, you are actually finding the quantum circuit and you implement that. These are exactly the algorithms. These algorithms actually converge these objective function to a quantum circuit. So that's all they do. And uh, when you get the quantum circuit, you put it in the quantum computer as a service, the way I mentioned in the last slide, and you get the solution. Um, just for the sake of time and to add some um, uh, you know, 
to, to save some time for the questions. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, of course, the world is not ideal, um, you know, because there are challenges. Um, you might have heard about the Schrodinger cat thing, which is uh, dead or alive at the same time, just like the quantum system. The question is, if the, if the superposition, uh, even if I know how to implement that on a macroscopic object like a cat, if it is sufficient to give me the quantum advantage? Um, that, that's a hard question uh, because people are still looking for, uh, you know, the avenues where, where, where exactly the quantum advantage is coming from, what is exactly the quantum resource. Uh, but the bottom line is, even if we assume that uh, there are other challenges, some of them are technical, some of them are actually very social. So I just classify them in five different classes. Of course, noise and scalability um, is, is part of our technical challenge. We have made some significant progress, but um, noise is something that uh, we probably have to uh, work on as a community for as well. Scalability means that we have demonstrated success for smaller systems, but when I try to make it bigger and bigger, some additional crosstalks they emerge on my quantum chip. And the question is, if it is going to win the entire quantum computing or not? Uh, when I say scope, I mean that there are some quantum algorithms to solve certain class of problems, but it doesn't mean that all the hard problems that you can think of in the real world, we have a quantum algorithm for them. We actually don't. So for example, many CFD, the computational fluid dynamics in cases, we don't know how to solve, solve the partial differential equations uh, with the computational advantage uh, on a quantum computer uh, that that um, that does not require a field. So, so scope-wise, we need to make some progress when we do algorithm development and cost and workload is a more like um, you know, social question in terms of how you want to mitigate material science is going to play a very um, crucial role in order to mitigate noise and in order to extend the scalability. As I mentioned, that algorithm development will be necessary in order to uh, broaden the scope of quantum computer and what quantum computer can achieve. And nowadays, people are talking about the quantum economic development zone. Um, there are more and more user communities that are being developed. Um, hopefully, that will reduce the cost because if end up the day you have to access the quantum computer to the uh, to the cloud infrastructure, and there are more users and the more community involvement. There are more workforce that we train who are working either for research reasons or for developmental reasons, or even maybe some commercial deployment um, that will automatically be on the question of, um, of, of the challenge. So these are something that community has been working uh, quite extensively, but it is very important that we actually um, get across um, our barriers as well. Right. So, for example, we talk to uh, other societies where computation is necessary and quantum could be uh, viable. Alternative. So, I'm sure that there will be more collaborations um, from the quantum computing community with the analytics community, for example, with the financial community, for example, with material scientists. And uh, with that, we can probably. Uh, so, I'll just conclude. Thank you.